Good morning. Uh, excited to see you all in this room. This is great. I know it's not our full crowd, but this is such a great step in the right direction. Um, and I know that I'm extremely excited just to be able to worship with you all in person. It makes a huge difference to be able to do this together as a church family. So will you stand? Let's sing together.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And on the third again or oh, trample dead where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King oh, oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name for sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus I'll praise the name. this truth throughout this pandemic for me personally that it is only in Christ that we have hope it is only in Christ that I have hope and if I put hope on in anything else in this world it will fail me whether it be another person a government uh, whatever I can accomplish myself whatever security that I can try to grasp onto myself it will all fail and it is only in Christ that we have ultimate security ultimate salvation for our souls so as we sing this, let's come before our God, our King, and tell him personally that it is only in him 
that we can find our satisfaction, our hope, our peace, everything is only found in him. So let's sing this together. of reopening and being back together again. We know that this is just a building, but there is something so special about being able to be next to each other, be in person, and collectively as a church body, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship you together. And it's feeding my soul this morning. So thank you for that. I pray that you would continue to build into us, that you would draw us closer to you, mature us, mature us, disciple us, and move us into a deeper relationship with you where we live 
this faith out more and more, that we become more and more like you in this world. Because this world needs more people like you. It needs more people to step up and live like you did 2,000 years ago. Because we thank you, Jesus. We give you this morning. And we ask that you would just teach us something new this morning. Draw us closer to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. I've got a few very quick announcements. Um, first and foremost, as you may well know, you're sitting in the room. We are now open, so you can actually now register to attend. So if you're in the room now, you've already gone through the registration process. If you're watching online, uh, if at any moment you feel like you're ready to come back to this church building, there is a registration process. So you can find that at rockcreekchurch.org slash attend. Um, and everything on there is relatively straightforward. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, but there's an instructional video. It gives you very, very good details as far as how to actually come in place. So uh, we'd really encourage you to do that. We love being able to see you in person. I love seeing all of these faces this morning. Um, beyond that, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention with this whole attending process, uh, because there has been a little bit of confusion. So we are not actually live streaming. That's not something we can do on our building. So for those of you who are here right now, this message will be posted online a week from now. So if you're watching online, everybody, this is all happening a week earlier. So it's a little bit offset, and that's what we're trying to do, essentially, to, to solve this whole Sunday morning live streaming business. So if that makes any sense, basically what we did is we did a, a recording this last Thursday night. So for those of you who are in the room, uh, if you were not here Thursday night just three days ago, then you will, you'll notice that you might, we might have skipped a portion of First Peter. We didn't skip it. We recorded it Thursday night, and it's going live right now. So I know this is all very confusing because we're in like two different timelines. So if you're a nerd out there and like to think about different timelines, we're in two different timelines. Um, but that, hopefully that makes sense. So if you're here this morning and you weren't here Thursday night, you will be able to find Thursday night's message online. So all that to say, we want to make sure that you are very clear on how to, to access all of our sermons, all of our messages and in our services so you're not missing anything in First Peter. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it's a lot. Second of all, uh, quick giving update. We have a huge, huge praise. So obviously COVID has completely wrecked a lot of things in the world, and finances is one of those things that has been wrecked. Well, so giving at Rock Creek Church has not been the same since COVID hit. Um, but last month was the very first month that we actually hit budget since COVID hit. So thank you so much. That's huge. Um, more than anything, I mean, that's, that gets us really excited because we get to kind of dream a little bit again with COVID, um, or since COVID started, we get to dream a little bit about what, is, what does it look like to start rolling out our ministries in full again. So we're super, th super thankful for that, but also that's encouraging because we know that that means collectively as a congregation, we know that you are doing better because you are feeling like you can give again. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. I just want to encourage you to keep going, keep giving. The more that... that uh, we are able to operate as a church. The more, the more resources we have, the more we can do ministry. So keep it up. If you haven't been giving, if you're feeling led to, I want to ask you to consider it. There's a few ways you can give. You can give online, rockcreekchurch.org slash giving, or you can also text to give. It's a very nice, easy thing. I've been using it, actually. You just text whatever amount you want to the number 84321, and uh, it gets you all set up there. So all that being said, those are our announcements for the morning. Check out this video, and we'll continue on in a moment. All right. Good morning, church. Yes. Good morning. All right. Look at us here. Woo! All right. Go ahead and stand up for me. If you're watching at home, go ahead up and stand there as well. Lori Russo, I know you're on your couch. Uh, stand up, uh, stretch, do some leg raises, wake up, move your neck around. Come on. I know you're feeling it already. It's been a short morning for some of you and a long morning for others. Good morning. Awesome. All right, have a seat. Uh, so glad that you are here. So glad that you're tuning in online. I have my phone here um, saying good morning. 
to the Dickinsons, uh, trying to make sure that you who are watching online, either because you choose to or because you have a, a condition that forces you to stay home online, we want to keep engaging with you on a regular basis. Uh, we want to make sure we're continuing to provide the absolute best quality of an online presence for you so that you can continue to grow, whether you are in Nebraska, Washington, California, Texas, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, places all over the nation that are tuning in on a regular basis. We want to make sure that we're still engaging with you. We care deeply about you, correct? Awesome. So uh, if you haven't run and gotten your Bible, please do that at home. Also for you in this room. Um, can someone get me some water? Believe it or not, um, coughing and sneezing took place prior to COVID. Uh, and so I've got a little tickle here. Um, run and grab your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, this morning. We've been in this uh, incredible series, truly an incredible series in 1 Peter called Hope in the Midst of... <coughs> How's that for our first service together? The pastor can't stop coughing. Um, how's that water coming? It's coming. We ran to the store? Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so we've been in this series, Hope in the Midst of Chaos, we named it. Uh, a little hustle there, Pope. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. It's super tacky. That is refreshing and helpful. All right, I feel better. We've been in this series that we very much believe God ordained a long time ago. We thought about this series roughly a year ago, and we named it Hope in the Midst of Chaos. And I don't know about you, but on a regular basis, uh, it feels like the world's kind of in chaos. Uh, from a global perspective, but also maybe just your individual life, right? You, you get on your phone or you go to your bedroom or you, you sit in your office and you just go, man, it's chaotic. And I am so thankful to the Lord that uh, he knew this was going to be happening in our world. He knew uh, this was going to be happening in our culture. And he put it very heavily on our hearts to do this a year ago. And we thought, yeah, maybe it'll be applicable uh, to someone, but it'll be God's truth, and turns out it's applicable to all of us. So I'm really, really grateful to God uh, for His Word, and I'm grateful for His Spirit giving us guidance. If you've missed any of our messages uh, throughout this series, please jump on our website, Rock Creek. Dot org, and you can uh, catch up with all of those uh, sermons uh, because that will set the stage for what we're even talking about uh, this morning. <clears throat> How many of you have heard the phrase, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going? Raise your hand. Yeah. We, I, I, I don't enjoy talking about suffering. <laughs> Peter does, apparently. Uh, Peter takes a whole chunk of his epistle and talks about suffering. Uh, and so uh, this line, the, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, it's a line that ended up becoming the theme song to a Michael Douglas film called The Jewel of the Nile. Any of you ever seen that movie? Yeah, it's a pretty good movie if you want to check it out. Um, there's other songs that have written about it. It's this idea that look within and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And somehow come up with some kind of inner fortitude, inner strength, inner power to overcome. In other words, uh, make lemonade out of lemons. You heard that phrase? The only problem is, what happens if you're trying to make lemonade out of lemons and you squirt lemon in your eye? Has your suffering increased? A lot of times that happens. We, we try to make the best of our situation and it only gets worse. What if you don't have bootstraps? What if you don't have boots? What if you don't have something inside that you can pull up? What if you don't have that strength? Some of you here, but also online, you know exactly what I'm talking about when you've been at your breaking point and there is no more strength. There's nothing in you left to, quote, be strong and power through. 
How do we do that? Well, for the follower of Jesus Christ, that strength, that power doesn't come from within. It doesn't come from our own strength. It doesn't come from a mindset. It doesn't come by looking in the mirror and slapping yourself in the face and getting yourself revved up. It comes from the outside. It it comes from something not of this world. It it comes from a, a power and an authority that isn't seen, but is felt and experienced. It's this idea that strength doesn't come from becoming stronger but strength actually comes by becoming weaker. Some of the most respectable people I would be willing to bet that you know in your life are willing to be weak, are willing to be less than, are willing to expose the real condition of their heart because by becoming weak and helpless, that's where we receive strength. Jesus said this, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My power is made perfect in you thinking you can do it. No. My power, Jesus says, is made perfect in weakness. It's a different way of looking at things. You know this. Christians are not exempt from pain. Anybody think that? Anybody think just because following Christ, you're exempt from pain and struggle? I hope not. It's not going to happen, especially if you're following Christ. Even when trying to do it the right way, struggles still come. I'm trying to raise my kids the right way. I'm trying to eat healthy. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to manage my finances right. And then bad things happen, even though you're trying to do the right thing. And a lot of times, our initial reactions is this, why me? I'm trying to do everything right, why me? Or or better phrase, why do I deserve this? Why do I deserve this pain, whether it's a physical pain, a mental pain, an emotional pain, a spiritual pain? I'm trying to do it right, why do I deserve this? Or I gave my life to Jesus, and this is what I get? A lot of times we can't sense that, but I promise you, first century church could. I'm following the ways, the teachings, the person of Jesus Christ, and this is what I get? And so Peter writes this epistle to Christians who are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. And Peter is wrapping up this letter. He's coming around the home stretch. The Pope is going to lead us next week. Stan is going to lead us the following week. And then Alex is going to close up this series in 1 Peter. We are on the home stretch. And Peter is trying to give some closing remarks. He's going to move on from suffering, but he wants to give some closing remarks. Here is what it says. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Dear friends, this is out of the New Living Translation. Don't be surprised. If you have a Bible, underline that word, circle that word surprise. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. Now, this is countercultural. Be very glad for these trials. Make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will what? Be blessed. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder. Now he's going to go into what you shouldn't be suffering for. You shouldn't suffer for killing someone, for stealing, for making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. We call those nosy bodies. Don't be one. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. That's us. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, he just wants to continue to drive this point home. If the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that brings glory and pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never, ever, ever, ever fail you. 
Amen? So let me review, because we can read this and we can go, wow, Peter's like, he's on to something. Well, I want to continue to give us a historical context, because the historical context allows these words to literally jump off the pages and take life of their own. They're powerful and life-giving if we read them in and of themselves, but even more so if we understand what's going on when Peter is writing this letter. It was the summer of 64 A.D. For nine straight days, a huge, uh, a a life-changing fire swept through all of Rome and destroyed literally everything. The emperor at the time, Nero. We've mentioned him a few times throughout this sermon series. Alex has mentioned him. Dan's mentioned him. I've mentioned him. We're going to dig into it a little bit. The emperor, that the one who's in charge of all this, is Nero. Uh, to put it lightly, he was psychotic, to say the least. Uh, by far one of the most wicked men ever to walk the planet Earth. He was known for killing anyone if he had the slightest suspicion that they were going to betray him. He was also known for his desire uh, and ambition to rebuild Rome at any cost, no matter cost financially, no matter cost to life. So when this huge fire set out, Roman troops were even stopping people from extinguishing the fire. They wanted it burned down to the ground. And so Nero's men would go around and they would actually start more fires as the Christians were trying to put the fires out. The general population began to resent their emperor at the ultimate high. Imagine this, a country who doesn't like its leader. One report said about Nero, he, as the fire was burning, quote, he stood in the tower of Mycenaeus and watched gleefully as the city burned to the ground. In fact, he was charmed by the loveliness and the screams from the flames. This is Nero. And so Nero realized, uh, there's a public outcry against me. I'm going to blame someone else. I'm going to make sure someone else takes the fall for what's going on here. And so guess who he blamed? Yeah, Christians. Christians got the blame. They became the scapegoat for the burning of Rome. And this was actually evil but brilliant on behalf of Nero. Why? Because Christians were already ostracized. They were already being picked apart. They were the low-hanging fruit. They were easy to kick to the curb. And so why not just throw more on top of them? And so that's exactly what Nero did is, is he began a campaign in 64 AD, that the Christians are the one who started and inflamed the burning of Rome. Now, this made sense because all the Christians at the time were already being destroyed by false presumptions about their faith. Some of you might have experienced this, where maybe your unbelieving friends or family members or neighbors or coworkers have a, a thought of what does it mean to be a Christian, and they project that onto you, and you're like, no, 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 that's not even the case. Well, it was the same thing for this first century church. They presumed that Christians actually practiced cannibalism. You know where they got that? Because they took communion, the body and the blood. And so they were disgusted by Christians because they thought they eat one another. They thought there was incest. Why? Because brothers and sisters greeted each other with a holy kiss. And so the rumor began to spread Christians practice this act. They were dividing up families as as individuals like a woman coming to Christ in a marriage and all kinds of other false accusations. So Nero was brilliant. He's like, this is the perfect time. Just heap this onto them as well. And then Nero led the assault to kill Christians. Because once he got the rumor started, it was the perfect opportunity now to act on it. And he began to kill Christians. He captured others using them as human torches for his garden parties at night. He allowed Christians to be literally sown alive inside a dead animal carcass to be devoured by predatory animals. And other 
heinous, unjust tortures. This, this is your heritage. If you're a follower of Christ, this is your lineage. These are your ancestors for the name of Jesus. And this persecution and more, way more, X-rated, R-rated, NR-rated, more things happening to Christians by this man, this began a persecution of a 200-year campaign to destroy Christians, to destroy Christianity. 200 years of these kind of heinous acts. And one emperor after another, after another, after another would seek to kill and destroy Christians. But praise God, we're still here. Christ still lives. The great empire of Rome is gone. Nero is gone. But Jesus and his church lives on. And this is because Jesus is alive and he's still ruling the world with grace and mercy and judgment. Friends, this is how you read 1 Peter. This context, this umbrella of what's going on in life, that's why these words matter. And so when you hear Instead, be very glad at these trials. I don't know how many of you have ever seen torture. I haven't. But it seems a little counterculture for Peter to say, be very glad in these trials. For you have a greater hope. And Peter is writing this letter towards the end of that year. Just after this persecution started, that's when Peter is writing this letter. Why? Because he wanted them to have the proper attitude and action and reaction to injustice. And not just injustice for others, but injustice for themselves. This is how you're to act. This is how you are to react The suffering came as a shock to most of them, much like it would to you and I. Perhaps they thought coming to Christ meant all of their problems would be gone. That if I give my life to Jesus, I will have no more problems with friends. That I will have no more problems with finances. That I will have no more problems with work. That my body will remain strong. It won't fail me. That, That all of my struggles, all my suffering, they're gone because now I'm following the King of Kings. And that's just not the case. You see, Peter didn't want believers just to get through suffering. He wanted believers to grow through suffering. And I so badly want to help you in the midst of any suffering that you have to grow through it, not just to get through it. And we're going to find out why this is so important to Peter. I know we've talked a lot about suffering Uh, I'm sure that the Lord really wanted them and wants us to understand perspective in the middle of suffering. And so the question that we're unpacking this morning is, how should believers respond to tough times because of faith? Not necessarily tough times, although all of these can be applied to it, but specifically, how can we live life in the midst of this culture that's opposed to the things of God How are we to do that because of our faith? Number one, remember that tough times are no surprise. They shouldn't be a surprise to you. If we spend the time reading the scriptures, you'll understand that. The the last thing we will ever want to do is encourage someone, follow Jesus Christ, give Jesus your life, make him the Lord of your life because it's just going to be smooth sailing from here on out. In fact, we should honestly look at someone and go, trust me, give your life to the King of Kings. It secures your eternity forever. He will walk with you in the now, but trust me, it is going to get hard. Now, that's not a great evangelism like outreach technique. But it's honest, it's real, it's transparent. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 
He says this, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. Don't be surprised. If you are going to follow Jesus, don't be surprised when the going gets tough. When the trials come. Interestingly, the first reaction we generally have when suffering hits is one of surprise. I can't believe this is happening. I had a great quiet time all week long. I've been walking with Jesus. I'm memorizing scripture. I'm involved in church. And yet, everything continues to go wrong in my life. And Peter says, don't be caught off guard. Don't be shocked by this. Condition your mind to be ready. Peter has been saying over and over and over again throughout the pages of his epistle, suffering is inevitable. And if you've been following closely any of the teachings, the real surprise is not when suffering comes, but the surprise really comes when suffering doesn't exist. That's Peter's. That's his life. That's Paul's experience. And notice how he addresses them first. Uh, In the New Living Translation and the NIV, it says, dear friends. In some others, it is referred to as my beloved. Now, if you're receiving this, again, let's go back. If you're receiving this, you're one of the church members, and it's written to you and for you, you pause for a moment your response might be something like this. My beloved, you still love me? God still cares about me? Sure doesn't look like it. My beloved? Peter starts this new section with beloved. It not only conveys Peter's tender pastoral side, but it literally means this, dear or very much loved. It's like a letter that Dan and Diane would write to each other. Like, my beloved, my dear, loved by God their Father. It is a love called out of one's heart, out of one's heart, and given the object of that love to another. You see, sometimes culture and sometimes we will slip into this that we think we're the object of God's wrath. We think we're the object of God's judgment. We think we're the object of God's rules when really we're the object of God's love. Nothing else receives that but us. Creation. We are the objects of his love. The NIV and the New Living Translation say dear friends and it just misses it. And I love the New Living. That's that's what I use. But it lessens the impact of this word. This word emphasizes and implies that they are the object of God's immeasurable love. Not a building, not, not anything else in creation, not the mountains, not the flowers, not the ocean, not the animals. Humanity, his children, his sons and daughters, you all, you're the object of God's love. So when he's in heaven, he's thinking, I'm going to love. I've got this this love that I can't contain in my heart. Where does it go? It goes to Miranda. It goes to Hunter. It goes to Alan. We receive that. There's nothing else that gets God's love. And we need to hear that word all the time in our heart, especially those who are struggling with suffering. Because if you're not careful, you will begin to wonder, when you suffer, does God love me? Does God even care about me? When your body's breaking down, when there's strife within your family, when you see a loved one suffering, does, does God even care anymore? And Peter so badly wants these people that are watching their loved ones be tortured and killed for game, to know God loves you. Don't lose that. Hang in there. And so Peter used beloved eight times in his two epistles to ingrain in their minds that they are loved by God. And circumstances will never change that. In your life and in mine, nothing can separate us from God's love. Romans chapter 8. 
And there is no pit so deep that the love of Christ is not deeper still. So as deep as you think you're in it, or as deep as you think someone you love dearly is in it, God's love is deeper still. So don't act surprised when tough times hit you. Number two, remember that tough times help us to experience true joy. Look at verses 13 and 14. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering so that you will have wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. You will have wonderful joy. So I shouldn't be bewildered or shocked when suffering happens. But how do I handle it? Peter says, keep on rejoicing. Even when you don't want to, keep on rejoicing. You have a bad day, someone slanders your name, people are ostracizing you, praise his name, rejoice his name, over and over and over and over. Keep on rejoicing. One commentator notes this, quote, Peter is far more merely advising his Christian friends to fix on a brave smile when suffering for Christ comes their way. He is not saying to rejoice in the pain. That would seem ignorant. He's not saying rejoice in the pain, but he's saying rejoice in what the pain will accomplish in our lives and what the suffering means for them now. All of this is a command. We choose to rejoice. What a commentators are super smart. Just great writing and great direction for you and I. Notice all the same root word all four times that we see in this passage. He is serious that we get this part. He's passionate that we don't miss this. I am passionate that you don't miss this in the context of your life. And I know for all of you in this room, you all have different things going on. For those of you who are watching online, look around your living room. You have stuff going on. And it's different for all of us. But Peter is serious. He wants us to experience biblical joy, which is deep, a divine delight in the plan, the purpose, and the person of God, regardless of our circumstances. Remember three guys that were thrown into the furnace in the book of Daniel? This is so great. Alex is leading us in songs of even in the fire. We're talking about this, the fieriness, the trials in the furnace. Remember these three guys? Daniel chapter 3. If you haven't read this story, just uh, tuck that away for later and go read the story. They threw these three guys in the furnace, furnace, but how many did the officials see? They saw four. Three thrown in and four are seen. And I want to say praise God that he joins us in the furnaces of our lives. Can you imagine walking through your struggles all by yourself? I'm not talking physically like I don't have family around, I don't have friends around, but you don't have your God around. Praise God that he joins us in the furnaces of our lives. Remember Paul who said that no one came to stand by me when I was persecuted. He says this, but quote from 2 Timothy chapter 4, quote, the Lord stood by me and he strengthened me. When no one else is going to stand beside you, when no one else is going to sit on your bed in tears with you, if no one else is going to sit at the kitchen table as you wring your forehead in stress, know that the Lord stands beside you and absorb his presence. Remember also Stephen. Stephen, upon being stoned to death, says that he was, quote, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus. This is so important. We miss this in Scripture. Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. Why is this important? This is the only time in Scripture that we see Jesus standing. And I think it's because Jesus is getting to receive Stephen into his arms. It's like when you have family come to town and you're standing in the doorway. Bring it in. Maybe pre-COVID, bring it in. Jesus is standing there, ready to receive 
Stephen in his arms and really to stand with him as the rocks are thrown. Friends, Jesus stands for you today. And where you are too weak to get up, Jesus stands for you. You see, often in suffering, we want an ejection seat. See those in like fighter pilots? Hit the eject button, they shoot out the plane, plane crashes, there goes $20 million and they parachute down. That's what we want in our suffering often. We just want to parachute, we want to get out of it. But it's right there in the middle of the pain that we can experience his closeness. It's right there in the pain and the suffering that we can experience the closeness of God. Mark Twain once said this, if God answered all my prayers, I would seriously doubt his wisdom. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm awfully glad God hasn't answered some of my prayers. A, because I would have missed it, but also he knows better. God is wise and he knows what we need even when often it is not what we want. Number three, t- remember that tough times help us re-examine our hearts. This is from 1 Peter 4, 15 through 18. Again, God disciplines those who he loves. We read that in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Again, God's love is one that desires to perfect us, not to pamper us. Listen to this, especially for those of you who are fairly young. You decide if you're young. God wants to grow you, not pamper you. He's not interested in any way, shape, or form, I believe, of making you happier and more comfortable. He's not an airline stewardess. He's not saying, do you need another pillow? Do you need another blanket? Do you need something to drink? Do you need a warm-up? Like, he's not your servant. His desire is to perfect us, not pamper us. Suffering is a great time for self-reflection and examination of our hearts. Because of this, suffering is meant to purify us, not destroy us. Your suffering, whatever you go through, is meant to purify you, not destroy you, not to make you miserable, not to send you in a deep, uh, dark place of deep despair, but it's meant to purify you. And when God puts us in the fire, it's his plan to get us to search our hearts, to look inward, to take an honest examination of who we are. This is part of growing when the going gets tough. But if all we want to do is hit the ejection seat, we are going to miss it. You're going to miss the greatest opportunity for growth. Perhaps you have doubted the Lord's goodness. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Maybe you watching online, you've had a moment where you've doubted the goodness of the Lord. Suffering is a great time to ask the Lord to search our hearts, to reveal any wicked way in us. Alan Redpath, any of you know Alan Redpath? He's one of the former pastors of Moody Church. He was once sent to the hospital. He said while he was lying in the hospital, he was struggling Remember, remembering his sin. He was having this moment where he's like, man, I, I remember this sin and this. I thought all of these were dealt with and I still have this sin. He thought he had given those up long ago and he couldn't believe it. By the time he got out, he said the time of suffering was so good for him because he said, quote, I realize the only good thing about Alan Redpath is Jesus Christ. And friends, that's a good place to be in. When we remember the only thing that's good in me is Jesus Christ. Suffering might be a bumpy road along the way, but it loosens the grip of sin as we draw near to it. Uh, Pastor Greg Laurie recently used this analogy. I heard it on the radio. He said, if you have to choose between a smooth flight with a crash landing or a bumpy flight with a safe landing, you'll opt for the bumpy flight. Yes? Some of you hate flying, so you're like, I don't know. (laughs) Like bumpy or just one big bump? But there are those who say, I don't want trials. 
I don't want to go against the world system. I want to take the path of least resistance. I want to take the easy way out. I don't want to deal with conflict. I don't want to deal with pain. I don't want to deal with suffering. The world just needs to get along and live in harmony so we can just be peaceful. I want smooth sailing, and those people are foolish because they might escape a bump or two along the way, but they are in store for a fiery crash. On the other hand, those who presently deal with a, a bump or two along the way will make for a safe landing in heaven with our great triune God. Friends, this eternal perspective is so important to be able to fix your mind on the things that are way, 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 way out there. Jesus coming again. So suffering is no surprise, a time to experience true joy, and a time to re-examine our hearts. And lastly and quickly, the last one, remember tough times help us to trust God ultimately. Peter ends by giving us an application from verse 19. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for He will never, ever fail you. Notice it's according to God's will. All suffering passes through the hands of God before it comes to us. Oh, look at the word entrust. Some of your versions have that word. Entrust, it's a banker's term. It was a banker's term even in biblical times. It was this idea that you made a deposit for safekeeping. Some of you practice that now. You'll deposit your money into a 401k or you'll de deposit your money into a Roth account or whatever it might be. It's the same word used by Jesus when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke chapter 23. And this is not, this is important, this is not a single action. This is why we've got to continue as a church to get away from the, the momentary prayers. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I love you. Please be my Lord and Savior. A amen. It's more than that. It's a regular, constant attitude of keep committing, keep making those deposits of trust in the Lord your God. Why should you trust? Because the Bible says He is the great Creator. This means he's in charge. This means he's God. You're not. Hopefully that's not a surprise to you. He is sovereign. He can be trusted. He controls and rules the world. He is able to keep you in his hands to protect you and to provide for you. The opposite of trust is control. And I want to say this as loving as I can possibly muster in my pastoral being. Stop trying to control your life. Stop. Stop trying to take captive your entire life. Remember the song, Jesus Take the Wheel? It's one of Randy's favorites. Not judging. S stop trying to control your life. Trust him who keeps his hand on the thermostat. Really, Josh? Hand me your phone. It's in timeout. Trust him who will provide for you. Trust him who's the creator of the universe. Trust the one that knows how to make a mountain. Do you know anybody that can make a mountain? Don't trust them then. You know, buddy, any, you know anybody who's ever invented a flower or a raindrop? Or a sunset? Or knows every single hair on those of you who are blessed to have it? That's God. You trust the creator of the world who brought all things into being with everything you need to persevere to the end. Keep making deposits of trust into that bank and it will reward you with dividends beyond your wildest imagination. This is good stuff. Man, this is truth. This is truth that gives energy and strength in the midst of the suffering. This is, this is truth that changes your life. 
This is truth that allows you to turn on the news and watch it for 60 seconds and still be able to say, it's well with my soul. Listen to what English Anglican priest and theologian John Stott says. He said, I could never myself believe in a God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? I turn to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back that is lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He set aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood and tears and death. If you've not read a lot of John Stott's material, I strongly encourage you to pick up some of his stuff and read it. This is the God for us. This is the God for you. Pain is real. Suffering is real. But the cross is real. Remember not to be surprised by suffering. Remember tough times allow us to truly experience His joy. Remember tough times help us to give us an opportunity to examine our hearts. And remember tough times force us to trust in Him. You see, we don't have to pretend that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's hogwash. We don't need to do that. We don't have to get going. We can, we can lay there before the rugged cross. We can cast ourselves completely there, broken and helpless, searching for hope somewhere, somehow. And embrace those wooden timbers again and again and again and again and again, over and over and over. For it's there at the cross that Jesus cuts open our hearts and pours out self and pours himself and his love in. And then we're transformed. One pastor put it this way, here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, where the prince of our life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's continue to worship. Lift Christ up as we sing this. May he be magnified. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand songs to lift one cry, and then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. The whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified.
singing, oh, Christ be magnified. Just let his praise arise. Oh, Christ be magnified.
salvation has been completely accomplished on the cross once and for all. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we should do. We can simply come to Jesus, delight in him, and know that he has given us everything we need. So let's sing this together. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life Praise the one. Church, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for tuning in online. This is all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. So run to him, delight in him, learn more and more what does it mean to be his child and that he has accomplished everything for you. And because of that truth, we get to live differently to a world that desperately needs it. So go in peace. We'll see you next week.
Can I tell 